Uh, today, I'm very pleased to say that we've got uh, Simon Bernstein with me, uh, who I'll pass on to kind of his introductions in a moment. But we felt that it was important, especially with everything going on at the moment and people still kind of figuring out things for the white paper and then new new policies coming out. The best way to to start looking at how we can be more customer centric, what we can be doing to really make sure we're living and breathing those values that um, that we say we're going to do as housing providers, and yet sometimes are difficult to implement. Um, so like I said, I'll pass over to Simon in just a minute. If you are uh, wanting to join in the chat at any time today, I'll be monitoring the chat function in the bottom right, so feel free to put anything in there. But better if you're, if you're happy to, please dive in on the conversation at any time. Uh, the reaction to is the easiest way to do it, is raise hand or lower hand, um, and I'll monitor those. Uh, alternatively, actually raise your hand and I'll bring you in if you're on, if you're on camera and wanting to. But on that, I'll pass over to Simon for you to do your introductions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Good, good, af good afternoon. It feels like afternoon. It feels like afternoon in some gloriously beautiful sunny resort. Although unfortunately, it's not beautiful. It's not glorious, and, and I'm in Liverpool at the moment, so it's slightly, uh, slightly disappointing in comparison to some of the places you would expect to be with weather like this. So, welcome everybody. It's really good to see you all. Um, thanks for the introduction, Matt. What today is about, or this session is about, is about, I want to hear from you. I've got some ideas and some thoughts based on my experiences of working with a wide range of, of housing organisations, including people like Riverside, Aspire, Gen2, um, Unity, PFH, a wide range of housing associations, large and small, and focusing upon the customer experience. Now, we all know that we're in for a really, really difficult time. Yes, of course, you've got the Ombudsman's report, we've got the white paper, but if you think about what we're about to face, for those of us who are fortunate enough to be in a situation where, yes, the next few months, in fact, the next couple of years are gonna be a real challenge. Imagine if you've got a very, very, very limited budget. Imagine if you've got a whole range of other things going on in your life. And of course, from a social housing perspective, many, many of our customers are actually in that sort of situation. And so over the next period of time, it's so, so important that we are absolutely brilliant at getting it right with customers because unfortunately the reputation of social housing has been somewhat damaged by the recent publicity in terms of the mould and the, 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 um, the damp and of course a whole other series of cans of worms that have been opened and in a way it's good that they have been opened because we can then respond to them. So what I'm going to talk to you about is about how customer centric are you? Now every organisation says we put our customers first, our customers are vital to us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what's the reality? The reality often with, with many organizations is yes, they do their absolute best, but because sometimes systems or processes are the things that are driving that experience, sometimes that might necessarily work out in the way in which we want it to. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is what do we mean by customer centricity? What do we mean by it and, and how do we ensure that we're aware of is our culture contributing to or acting as an obstacle towards um, that customer centricity? So, Matt, is it normal practice that everyone goes around and does a quick introduction? Uh, yeah, we can do. We absolutely can. Um, though I think with this many people in the room, I think if you do your intro, Simon, um, and kind of explain, you know, how, how you've got to where you are in your journey at the moment. And then I'll get people to introduce us if and when they dive in on the conversation and as, as they wish to, because... Otherwise, you lose 15 minutes doing introductions, as you can yeah, imagine. That's great. OK, so I've been working with um, housing for the last, in fact, it's 20 years on July the 2nd. I've got a background of having worked at Riverside for six years, um, where I was involved in, first of all, from a marketing perspective with a rebrand, because Riverside used to be called MIH, Merseyside Improved Homes. And as you can imagine, growth ambitions of going into Manchester with the name Merseyside in your title, you've got no chance whatsoever. So it was a, a, a decision in relation to being more generic. And of course, we all know how big they've grown um, in, those, in those last few years. So I started out where I had a passion for the customer experience. When it, initially it was customer service and I delivered, uh, along with a few colleagues, a customer service training program within Riverside. I decided I like doing this, so it, I, I left. And over the last 20 years, I've worked with a, a few different sectors. 
I've worked with the legal sector, I've worked with the health sector, but my, my passion, because I've been involved in it directly, is housing. And over the period of time, I've noticed the way in which the approach that is needed has changed. So, for example, in the old days, it was the focus upon, you should say this, you shouldn't say that. And then it was also around how do we ensure that um, we are being as as focused upon what we think that, that customers want and rather than what customers want. And of course, there's high levels of participation through uh, tenant involvement. And so over the last five years, particularly, I've been really driving towards the customer experience, um, which is, is common language now. And I've done things on a number of ways. I've either worked directly with organizations or with Gen2. I act as, acted as the critical friend and worked with them to develop a program, but not just a training program. It was a cultural evolution and that is still ongoing now and has been a really great experience for me. So what do you mean by customer centricity, Sam? What do you mean by this phrase? Yeah, what we mean by customer centricity is a, a, an organization whose culture is built from the customer at the heart. So for example, we've all gone through situations over the last two years where remote working has become very much the, the norm. And with in, in, involving in that is that we then talk about agile working. And again, agile working is about a culture which enables and empowers people to make decisions which are going to be the best for customers. And what that means is, is that customer centricity means everything that you do has got the, the customer in the middle. So what effect is this having on our customers? What do our customers consider to be the value judgments? What is it that we can do to ensure that our customers are, first of all, able to express their ideas, their opinions, their thoughts? And we are then either responding to that or we're actually being proactive in nurturing their, their, what they want and helping to deliver those, those expectations. And in addition to that, one of the things that I say to organizations is if you are genuinely customer centric, are you talking to your customers? I don't mean sending a satisfaction survey out. I mean, are you talking to them and finding out in depth what they really think, what they really feel, what have they I know one of the things on just on that is, and we've talked about this on some of the roundtables before, and I know some people who've, who've done these before have joined me on that, has been how, how you're communicating with customers is some of the things. So what, what processes have you maybe introduced or implemented to improve that narrative between customer and housing provider? Because that's often where a lot of the breakdown comes from is, accessibility it's diversity and it's also um you know actually just trying to get people to engage that's a really good point matt and one of the things is is that digitalization has lots of benefits but also has a lot of down down sides to it and if you consider in terms of from a digitalization perspective and let, let's talk about having an app apps are really really great in certain situations and certain circumstances. But if you think about it, in terms of, let's say for example, somebody is self-reporting a, a repair, for example, is what percentage of those repairs are able to be, to be delivered first time? Because if you think about it, again, in my time in working with housing, one of the big gaps is information gathered in terms of a repair versus information given to that technician who goes out to do that repair. And as a result of that, how many of those repairs are because we've got the right equipment, we've got the right skills to be able to do that first time. So it's about really thinking about how, what is the best way of communicating from customer's perspective? Yeah, digitalization is great because we're going out with iPads and being able to record everything that's happening there and then. But it's also about thinking about the right style for the right situation. And Maria, you had your hand up. Yeah, Maria, do jump in. It's uh, nice to have you with us today. Hi. Um, I totally agree with everything you said there, Simon. And when I was working at BDHT, uh, Graham Anderson, who has previously been on uh, Matt's Roundtables, was leading on customer segmentation. 
connection. Sorry, Marie, you might have lost you there. So yeah. we had a oh, got you back. whole <laughs> project whereby we looked at putting our customers so we could... Um, did you hear what I said about segmentation? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's fantastic way of marketing towards your customers. Um, there's a company called Voicescape, which is also, you know, once you who your customers are to make it customer centric and you can market and segment other people that want to use apps so it's about knowing your customers first and I think things like voice gay is a great way of uh, sort of reaching out to your customers in I got most of what you said then yeah. time and I'll pass it yeah. to you yeah, that, that's really absolutely right. What, one of the things that, that I've been doing with the organizations that I've worked with is around, there's two things, and that is, first of all, is customer journey mapping. So is, is thinking about quite often when people talk about, oh, we're doing customer journey mapping, quite often it's the process. It's the process that the, the organization actually used to provide customers with the service. But customer journey mapping is always, everything has to be, as a customer. So we need to get people who are more able to think like a customer. So if, for example, you're buying something on Amazon, the customer journey is, and this happened to me, I needed a new charger for my computer very quickly. I browsed on Amazon, I selected, I paid, I was told when it was going to arrive, it arrived and it worked. That's all I was interested in. Of course, behind all that, there's a huge number of inter relationships that can't go on between uh, Amazon and their suppliers, Amazon and the couriers, Amazon and the banks, and so on and so forth. However, it's thinking about that suited my particular need. And one of the key things here is, is that whole thing around profiling customers, because if you think about it, there's a whole range of different things that contribute to what a customer might want or need at a particular point, their age, their health situation, do they have disabilities? What's their caring situation? What's their family situation? What's their employment situation? What are their life experiences? All these things will enable us to actually ensure that we're, we're not just looking at a customer, we're looking at a whole range of different customer personas. And with the work that I've been doing with Gen2, we spent a lot of time on that in actually recognizing the fact that, that customers have got such a multitude of different needs that again, thinking about how the access and how we actually engage with them, that's just one of the areas, but it could be about, you know, how do we do the repairs? How do we ensure that we're providing them the right tenancy support? All these things are so, so important. And that's why it is about, as, as you've said there, Marie, that, that segmentation is, is customer profiling, understanding the fact that there's a wide range of variations in what customers might actually want so that you can demonstrate that you are customer centric. I'm going to open up the, the, the floor to, to hopefully somebody who's going to dive in here. So I, I, I'll try not to pick on anybody. A couple of people smiled, so unfortunately it might be you. Um, is any is anybody kind of had any like particular methods of innovation or anything they find is working for them now that maybe wasn't working at the beginning of the year or or a year ago, in terms of ways to connect with customers, engage with uh, engage with tenants who previously, either through I don't know it could be diversity, it could be language, it could be um, just generally people who didn't want to previously engage and now are. Is anyone doing anything quite innovative that they're finding is working very well? Come on, somebody. <laughs> Yes, Dolores. Hello. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I'm quite new to the sector, if I'm if I'm honest. I've been in the sector just for nine years in the West Midlands. Sorry, nine months in the West I was Midlands. Say nine years. I'm thinking that. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if it's innovative, but we have a customer experience panel, and we also have a customer sounding board. Um, and one of the things that we do through our customer experience teams is really just go out to customers, anything that we're thinking about changing, et cetera. We're not getting it right 100% of the time, but really just trying to get their feedback on it. But there's more 
that we could be doing. So I'm really interested in, you know, everybody who's here today and what kind of things you're doing to engage with the customers. Um, Simon mentioned about um, repairs. I have responsibility for new builds during um, the defect liability period and looking at customer engagement during that time, particularly when you're dealing with defects, um, is is quite interesting. So where are the biggest barriers there? What, what, are the, what are the biggest stumbling blocks? I think some of the, the barriers are the customer's expectations in terms of potential repair times, the fact that the defect liability period is a year and developers, for example, who sometimes the communication could be better with customers. Um, and then we as the housing organization, how you cement that all, all together. What's the difference between that customer experience panel and the sounding board? Because that sounds quite interesting. So the, the customer experience panel, they are, for example, when we have complaints, any letter that goes out before a, a complaint, a final review, they will review that. That's part of our, we've built that into our complaints process. The customer sounding board could be on anything. So they might be 200 customers that have volunteered to be part of this sounding board. And it could be anything from, we're thinking of, changing our tenancies what do you think about this or we're thinking of um, doing a customer satisfaction survey here's the survey what do you think of it what's the language like i think you know what, what you said there delorius is is really important because language is is so so important isn't it in terms of you know i've i've read some things that that some housing organizations have put out and I look at it and, and I'm experienced obviously in this area and I look at it and go, what? It, it makes no sense. It is in a way, it, because if you think about it, one of the things that the housing sector as most are as well known for is, is jargon. Mm. If you think about it, you know, we all talk in terms of voids, don't we? Well, what, what's a void? You know, is it, isn't a void an empty property? You know, so why, why aren't we saying it? So it's about really thinking about from a, a language perspective is having a culture within an organization, which is really, really focusing upon the 1%. So that 1% is about thinking about, right, when we're communicating with customers, how can we make that, that 1% more efficient, more effective? So is it by the, the frequency? Is it by the medium? Is it by the language that we're using? And the other thing to remember is, and one thing that I would like to, to talk about in terms of how customer centricity really works is, one of the great things that we do is we actually measure the wrong things. So if you think about it, in relation to the processes which are important to customers, which support a great customer journey, if you think about, the lettings process, as an example. There are so many KPIs, which actually mean that you're never gonna get collaboration because the, the maintenance team have got to do something within a certain time and within a certain budget. You've got the lettings team who've got something similar. And so as a result, it's thinking about what's the outcome that we need. And ultimately, whoever you are, whichever housing association you are, the most important thing from a customer perspective and from a business perspective is a sustainable let. Because the more times that people move in and move out and you have to re-let, et cetera, et cetera, that's when you're actually, it's first of all, really bad customer service. Secondly, it's costing you so much more. So it's that's thinking awesome about- point. I'm gonna bring Jenny in because she's been waiting yeah. a while. I'm gonna keep conversation flowing. Jenny, let's bring okay. you in. Come on, Jenny. Yeah, I was just going to mention about our customer group at Aspire. So we, we've got a customer group that we try to put quite a lot of our things through. So if we're sort of providing policies or procedures, um, we put them, we put that through that group. But the problem that I've got with that group is that it's not a very diverse group of people. And I think that that's what we find with customer engagement is that they're probably majority of them, probably 80% of them are over the age of 60 now. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with any anything with people over the age of 60 but there's not a diverse age range of people on that group so where we go and put things like ASB policies through to that group 
really, you know, what, what is that group's experience of that ASB policy? Should we really be, you know, when we close an ASB case or whatever, going actually to speak to them customers at that point and saying, we've just closed that ASB case with you as a complainant. How have we done? You know, what, what, what could we have done better or what haven't we done better? That's really Jenny, interesting. You I know are... it's down at um, Curse Fire and Newcastle and Lyme, aren't you, in terms of... Uh, I used to, I went to university at Kiel. That's the only reason I know it. So I know it well. Um, and uh, you know, and I know there's a huge range of uh, ASB initiatives, both with the council as well, and, and what's gone on there. And every, I think the the entire area of the last ten years has gone through a big transformation, which is which has been brilliant. How are you trying to? And, and let's you know, I mean, we talk about diversity and that kind of thing. Unfortunately, you know, you look at that area of Staffordshire, it is very very white. It is you know those kind of things. But by sound of it, it's the age. The age gap there that is the struggle so what how have you tried to kind of engage with young people on those what what initiatives are in place at the moment i guess it's it's it goes back to the covid thing as well doesn't it so you know since covid we all work in very different ways and and previously sort of residents meeting or when you when you've got a group of customers that you want to meet with it's always been held at your sort of your corporate offices and you invite people in and it's always been between the hours of nine to five for example and then straight away I guess that limits the, the people that are going to attend um so I know at the moment that they've they've been sending they've been we sort of did like a bit of a um we did what's called like a chat to experience and we contacted all aspire customers and we actually did it through covid via email whereas the first time we did it by person and we've actually had a wider sort of range of diverse people coming back to us via email because actually that's easier for them to communicate with us outside of office hours you know they can apply to us at whatever time they want they can come back to us via instant messaging uh, or they can provide that feedback outside of any other means of having to come into a sort of an office or a building between the hours of nine to five and I think sometimes that's where that flexibility in tech absolutely needs to run through. So really interesting. Lynn, I'm going to bring you in. Great to have you with us. I know you're looking at this from both an executive side and a board side. So I imagine this has always been something important. Thank you. Um, I think uh, my experience is, is quite different from the perspective of where I'm working at the moment. So I'm doing an interim role at Epic, which has been downgraded. And it was downgraded for basically not looking after its customers uh, from a health and safety compliance point of view. Um, so I, obviously I came in and we've done an awful lot of work to just get that those um, mechanisms in to make tenants safe and have started now to try and engage with the customers but hugely difficult to overcome the disillusionment that Epic has gone through and re-engaging them. It looks in the past as if tenants were quite engaged, but I, I'm, I, that's why I'm kind of asking for it, <laughs> any input, is getting over that hurdle of them just saying, ah, well, you won't do, you will do what you say. And I know it will take a period of, we are doing what we say and we are delivering, but, I want to, what I will make sure I do actually is I introduce you to Hannah Harvey. Uh, she's been on a round table with me before and they had exactly the same issue three and a half years ago when she joined Saffron Housing. Um, they went in and they've been downgraded. They were at the point where they were, you know, potentially going to be going to be shut. And they had exactly the same issue, complete disillusionment from customers and went through a huge transformation piece. So I will connect you to, but Simon, in terms of on that, I know you work with a number of businesses. What, what do you have to share? Yeah, I think... Um, Jenny, I know Jenny really well because I've been working with Aspire for about the last four or five years around a range of different topics. And Keel Hall is a beautiful place, isn't it, Matt? It's 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 the place to go. Um, it would be lovely but, today, certainly. <laughs> what what I would say is is that you've got the best resource you could wish for, and I'm, I'm in a way I'm reinforcing what Jenny said, and that is for those people who have complained, for those people who've given you compliments, for those people who've experienced the service. They're the ones who are really important. I'm not going to name the organisation, but I was working with, with some involved tenants. Uh, this is going back about three or four years. And I've been working with them for about three and four years. And it was exactly the same people all the time. And it, they got to a point where they were literally talking about the housing association as we. They weren't talking about it in terms of them. They were talking about it in terms of we. And so really, in actual fact, they were, they were institutionalised. They, they were not providing an objective view. And it's so, so important that, you know, as um, 
housing association is when people do give some form of feedback is you grab it and you use it and you you grow it because they're the people who care if you think about yourselves how many times have you been asked for feedback from an organization and you've provided that feedback and you know it doesn't count you know it doesn't do anything because you're never hearing i i Virgin Media, I've given Virgin Media zero stars on at least five occasions. Do I ever hear anything from them? No. Why? They're not bothered. But the whole thing here is because of the, the relationship that you have with your customers is, is use that resource. Use that resource to actually, and, and not using the same people all the time. Now, I know it's difficult to get those engagements, but I'm sure thinking about your situation, Lynn, I would imagine that you, if, if the, the Paint, picture your painting would suggest that maybe you've had lots of complaints in in the past um no don't That's bother <laughs> they, don't they are totally disillusioned i'm about to say i think it's probably by the sounds of it they've given up yeah, yeah. and that yeah. is so sad that is so sad um but again is about perhaps is about trying to be um innovative in terms of events so, you know, having an event where people can bring their kids along, where there's a bouncy castle, whatever the case may be, health and safety rules must be applied, of course, but making sure that you've actually, it, there's a reason to go, but you're actually using them when, um, when they were there. I used to work with Eastlands, which is now part of One Manchester, um, and they used to have some amazing events where they get loads and loads of people from the community in, and they get have stuff for the kids, and they would have lots of people walking around, engaging with people, finding out their experiences. And that is something because rather than it being, we want you to tell us about what you think about our services is if you're giving them something and then they're actually, the, the side issue is tell us about what you think about us. Then Very interesting things on that, Lynn, just before I bring Sally in. One, um, I've known some businesses have instead what they've tried to do is go and look at the Facebook groups and look at the Facebook groups and kind of go out to whoever's leading the Facebook group itself and saying, look, come in. But what one business and it's a G15. I won't. I won't say who. It's a, a new chief exec came in. I met her at the um, at the uh, housing 2022 conference. And what they've done, which was really interesting, is you know Quajo, the social activist who's kind of they invited him in, invited him in and said, look, go and sit with our residents panel, and we're going to leave the room. We're going to leave the room. Go and sit with our residents, and you tell us what's wrong. And they said the feedback they got from that was amazing because they felt like actually here's someone coming in that's really having you know so it's amazing about getting an outsider to come in who is you know speaking out against it or using your you know the people on the facebook groups or the biggest people on social media who are who are leading some of the charges and saying look we need we need you right now and i guess if you can get them involved there's everything else the only other thing that i know has worked and it's something we've pushed for quite recently on on some of these round tables we're trying to advance more is to try and get the young people who are our tenants in as apprentices if you can get young people in as apprentices and, and focus on that so rather than just putting an apprenticeship out into wherever so if it's but, but not just trades i mean i know we na naturally go trades but it could be custom service it could be hr it could be marketing and social media young people have so much to give us so many ideas and if you can get them engaged with your business the families will follow because they'll be interested for twofold one because you're actually doing something back but two well they're my kids i want to make sure they're being looked after Mm -hmm. Just some ideas I've heard come up on the round table before. Sally, I'm going to bring you in. Lovely hey, to see you, by the way. Matt. I haven't seen you in a little while. <laughs> I know. It's been too long. Uh, I, blame my, I blame the job move to London Borough of Ealing. So uh, it's been super busy. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, in terms of the important thing for me and from my point, uh, from what I've learned over many, many years of non-housing and housing work is the um, you said we did and feeding back um, to individuals and whether that's from defect side of things, which I used to run in a previous housing association, uh, right the way through to consulting residents about planning applications and stuff. If, if we don't record that properly, if we don't make the effort to go back to the individual who's made the comment and said, you said this, we did this in response or we couldn't do this in response because, but next time we will do it differently, um, is really important, really important. And regardless of 
who your customer is, whether it's a resident or whether it's another part of the business um, and uh, or whether it's a supplier. Um, that that is the most powerful thing. And the other thing, again, going back to my community development days, um, asset based community development. What is it about where people live, where your residents live that matters to them? So it comes back to what other people have been saying already today. What's important to them? Understanding that it might not be the fact that it's a house. It might be the fact that they've got great, that they've got great neighbors, for example. So it's finding out what those things are. So ABCD, asset-based community development, what is important, what matters, how can you make it even better place to live? If you say even better, you're not putting a judgment on whether it's good or bad at the moment. It's going to be really even interesting, better. Actually, I know when, I think you were on the round table we discussed a little while ago actually, where somebody said they changed to a almost 24 seven repair service and the tenants turned around and went, we don't want, it. They, they went through the consultation, it was all internal, but they never thought to ask a tenant. And then actually you got to the end of it and going, tenants going, I don't want someone in on a Saturday morning. I don't want someone, I, I want them to come in during the week. And Simon, I know this we've talked about before as well. Mm. Yeah, I think it's very important. The whole thing here is, is that insight is only of any value if you're demonstrating the fact that you're listening to it. And one of the, the, the key things is, is recognizing the fact that each part of the organization is in a situation whereby they're regularly reflecting on that insight because thinking about what you've said sally in terms of the abcd is it's what customers value so how many call centers um, measure their performance by how many how long it takes to answer a call the abandoned calls but the most important thing to a customer most customers is that whoever they speak to is able to deal with their, their issue at the first point of contact. They don't want to be passed from pillar to post. So all in all, what we're talking about here is, is the value judgments, is how clear are you on what's important to the whole different diverse range of customers when a repair is being done or when they're experiencing antisocial behaviour or when they're being accused of antisocial behaviour or when they're unable to pay their rent or when and so on and so forth. And the value judgments, in other words, it's for those of you who've been involved with lean, you'll be familiar with the word critical to quality. So what is it that the customers are seeing as being absolutely vital in the services that they're receiving? Um, and I've, again, you know, this is about, but the insight is only a value if you're then de using it to improve what you're actually doing. And that has to be, that's where customer centricity comes in, is we respond to our customers by taking action. I agree more, Simon. I'm going to bring in uh, L Hughes. Apologies, I don't have your uh, full name there. <laughs> so, uh, hi, Simon. I met you the other day at the AIM yes. High. Yeah, so, AIM High. In sorry, Kiel Hall. <laughs> yes, Keel Hall. We love Keel Hall. Uh, I just kind of wanted to to say regarding Sally's comments, I completely agree there, Sally, because when I used to manage services and accommodation services many years ago, one of the things that we noticed was this, you know, we you said we did and the quick wins we got from that. Um, so, you know, trying to think of some examples because it was such a long time ago. But uh, what, what I can remember was that what we did was we focused on um, some Facebook posts that had been put on, which were quite negative. And we went to those individuals. We went to those individuals first. Now, a lot of people sometimes say, oh, I don't, I don't want those difficult conversations. I don't want to be talking to the people that are complaining. But what we did is went to those people first and got them on board. Um, through this you said we did very small very quick wins and by getting them on board we eventually got quite a substantial amount of people on board into a forum but it was sort of targeting that person in particular that was creating this um i suppose this negative impression of what was happening because they only had a small part of the conversation i suppose uh, so 
and I definitely agree with that. You said we did. And even if it's the smallest thing, as long as you do it and you take action where you say you're going to take action, people will slowly come on board. Uh, but you've just got to make sure you do it when you say you're going to do it. Yeah. I guess that's the issue Lynn has got on the flip side of it is at the moment people aren't even asking for action because they've kind of given up. So that, that's a whole nother, a whole nother side thing. Sorry, I didn't get your first name there. It's, uh, it's, it's Lisa. It's Lisa. Lisa. Yeah. I was trying to think of, I've been trying to quickly go through LinkedIn going, trying different else. No, lovely. Good to have you with us, Lisa. So in terms of then when you got that feedback, just as a, a throwback question to that, in, in that in that panel, did you find them because of the actions going on with this you said we did that actually it was getting quite diverse that panel or was it yeah it, voices coming up we got we got the the actual group was fantastic we got because we worked with 16 year olds up to 65 and we got groups from the age of 16 up to 65 and it was we had to we had to obviously change things as we went because 16 year olds don't necessarily have things that are important that a 65 year old might so we had to uh, we had to develop as we went along, but um, what we found was they worked really, really well together. You know, they, they wanted the same thing. They wanted a good service. That's what they want at the end of the day. They want a good service mm. uh, and they want to be listened to. And um, I think sometimes as, as organisations, we, we might have a couple of people that may ring up con continually asking for this, asking for this, asking for this, complaining about this, complaining about that. And... We, you know, we've heard it previously where people have said, oh, no, it's such and such on the phone again. Well, actually, pick that phone up, have that conversation, because get that person on board with what you're doing and you will find it's a whole lot easier. But we ha I, I left the organisation about five years ago. And at that time, it was it was really good. It was really good. And people were really engaged. But I totally get where you're coming from, Lynn, with regards to people don't even they're not even bothered. It's really difficult. Um, and I, we did set up what was what was called like a focus group initially just to get people's thoughts. Uh, we set up a Facebook page. We um, we had lunch, we had uh, cafe days where we went out to cafes and so we got some people coming out to cafes. We went off to the colleges where some of our younger students were. We we literally went out, and we want we found it took it took some time, you know. When were, we weren't a big group, but we just targeted those areas that we thought people might listen. We popped up. We popped up in Sainsbury's <laughs> on one occasion. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, got people talking and I think that was the that's what it was it was getting people talk, talking because I think some people were just sick of saying something and nothing being done and I guess well, that was we heard that didn't we? we've heard that recently with the the, the mold and, and and damp problems is a sense of we told them we keep on telling them, they keep on telling us they're going to do something and they don't and they, nobody listens to us I'd like uh, Sally sorry sorry go on it was just to say that it come, that that and then that comes back to your organizational culture. Yes. And um, if the organizational culture is not not right uh, to have that re response, however much you go out and do the engagement with your residents, um, you're still going to end up with disillusioned residents. So you've got to have people incentivized within the organization incentivized to actually take on the what normally goes in the too difficult box and have that across the whole organization. I work in development. I've never, never worked in housing management. I have briefly worked in repairs, very briefly. Uh, that was enough. And, um, but, the, but the whole thing is about getting that, that organizational culture. When I was working at Cross Keys um, at the start of COVID, the first thing we, we actually did um, was um how to start a be kind uh focus on residents who we knew were vulnerable and um that was a phone call so people were diverted off their normal duties to phone residents to chat to them because they're going to be self-isolating and everything else and yeah. the ones who we knew were living on their own and that then built up a much better rapport between members of the organization the staff in the in the organization and the actual residents especially those staff who would not normally come across a resident um except 
maybe through the defects process or whatever. Um, so we had people in our governance team doing that, doing the phone calls. Everybody across the board was involved in the, in those phone calls, and that then brought around the whole thing started to come full circle because they were actually people were actually talking to each other. Um, it's also and, 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 so then that brief cultural change, doesn't it? That's how yes. you get it is when everybody gets on board, particularly your senior leadership. I know I'm going to bring Emma in on this because I know she's going to back you up, actually. Uh, Emma, really good to have you with us. Hi, can you hear me? <laughs> um, yeah, it's looks been incredibly really... dark wherever you are, by the way. Like, you are <laughs> blocked out every bit of light I coming keep through. The sun today. Um, no, it's been really interesting. Um, listening to you all and and Lynn if I can help with just some experience to share some experiences that I've got so um I'm not from housing I've I've been in the private sector for the last 15 years and I've just joined housing the housing sector recently um so how we've always approached it is put the voice of the customer at the center of the organization and that would have multiple streams um, of adding to that voice. So it would come from rant and rave type feedback. So instant feedback, it would come from your star survey. It would come from, um, we work in a kind of um, a methodology around a customer comfort score. So that looks at the material of the building versus kind of the environment of the building. So what's the MPV, what's the floor spacage versus what's the ASB levels. And we'd create a formula at the back of, a, and, and that would cut, create our customer comfort score. We'd look at complaint trends, we'd look at complement trends. We would, if we were doing a new initiative, we would ring those customers up that maybe had complained and ask them to be part of our pilot as we roll it out and, and tweak it. And that really felt customers felt really empowered and actually part of shaping the direction of the company. We make sure that the, um, the customer experience panel, if you have a customer panel or a tenants board, that um, pay that go to the board always go there first for for kind of comments and that has to be on the front sheet of all board papers that come to board now so what we tried to do is do multiple channels of that voice of that customer coming in and put that right in the center of the organization that would be the kind of the sign off point so and because they, that voice of the customer is going to constantly change so what is really important to a customer a year ago might be totally different to what's important to that customer this year for example you know we can see that with the kind of the cost of living you know last year in terms of the rent rises and you know we're probably going to have it again so um <clears throat> so for us to keep that continuous service improvement to keep that continuous voice of the customer we put that right in the center of the organization and put that as the kind of um that would sign anything off in terms of key strategical decisions that the um, the company was looking to do. And so, how do you engage Emma with any voices that you know? I mean, if in the situation they mentioned, there obviously the one, problem is that no one's talking. So what have you used there? Because I know, like you say, you you say recent in housing. It's been a few years. Yeah. Now. <laughs> Um, it's been about 18 months now in housing. So I, I did a, uh, I worked in a, a local borough council and, and now I'm at Orbit. Um, <clears throat> what we did is we actually, um, you know, actually your complaints and your compliments, they're quite quick wins in terms of being able to engage because that customer's already engaged, whether engaged in a negative way or a positive way. What we actually did was then um, trawl through the data and look at customers that hadn't engaged with us over maybe a two to three year period. And we purposely did a whole campaign and reached out to a cus customers that had never, so they hadn't rung for a repair. They hadn't, um, they hadn't ever complained. They haven't ever done compliments. They hadn't used any of the services. Um, and we targeted that group as well. And we got, um, and that really helped us to be, um, to really kind of direct us on um, where we should look next in terms of our direction of travel and, and what the customer wanted. And I think what you said, Simon, about what the customer values, that's constantly changing. And that's yes. putting that customer voice into the centre of your organisation. So at the centre for sign off points, you know, for key strategic decisions really helped navigate the direction of travel based on customer values. Mm. 
I'd oh, no, Emma, that was brilliant. Thank you. I was going to say, Simon, I know this is something you've talked to businesses about yourself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, what you've said there, Emma, is clearly customer centricity, isn't it? And, and I think, you know, as long as you've got the right people with the right attitude and, and mindset towards that, with the right processes and also the right partnerships and collaboration so that teams are working together to use that, that information that you're gathering to affect all the different parts of that service. There's something I'd like to share with you. Um, I'd like to share this with you, if I can. Can I just check that you can all see that? Yeah, that's that, Simon. Okay. Um, sorry. So in terms of, from a, a, a customer experience perspective, this is some example in terms of just some very basic research in terms of what was important to somebody who was reporting repair. So it's easy. They understand the repair and how I feel. I know when they're coming. They arrive on time with the right tools and materials. They're polite and respect me and my property. And I know what they've done and don't need to get them back. That, that's the basics, isn't it, in terms of how that affects them. And it's also about the fact of Often when we've got problems with customer centricity, it's down to transitions. And that is when something happens which needs to be passed to another part of the, of the organization. That's when things can go, can go wrong. And it's thinking about within your business, within your organization, what is the level of collaboration? What is the level of collaboration between teams? So that again, going back to what I said before about how things are being measured, that they're measured appropriately. I wanted to, to introduce you to this, which is something which is the um, KPMG Nunwood Six Pillars of Customer Experience Excellence. And I just wanted to, to throw this into you to, to have a think about it in terms of how this could be used with you, with, from your perspective in terms of getting it right for your customers. Undoubtedly, empathy is at the heart of what we do, is understanding from a customer perspective. So understanding what's it like to have that music being played at three o'clock in the morning next door. What's it like to have that dripping tap, which is really causing me a great deal of anxiety. What's it like to have four kids in the, in the house when we've got damp? What's it like? So it's trying to ensure that there's empathy with customers. So it's not a process, it's not robotic, it's real. And then of course, it's about personalization recognizing that everybody is an individual and that people are making connections with customers. I'm absolutely passionate, and those guys at Aspire will remember this from the program that we did, about the importance of making connections with customers because the moment you make a connection, the moment that happens, the dynamics of those relationships change. So understanding it might be their birthday, it might be their anniversary since they moved into the property. They might have had a difficult time previously. So that, that um, CRM, information is so so valuable so that it's clear that you know about them you know about their experiences and you you really care about them as individuals managing expectations is really important but also being able to say no and i don't mean just say no outright offering alternatives but one of the things that we all experience as customers is when we expect something to happen and it doesn't or when we expect something of a particular quality and it doesn't. And I'm sure that you as customers outside of your roles have been let down on so many occasions when people say something's gonna happen that somebody will call you back and they don't. And I know from working with a number of customer service teams that their avoidable contacts are up to 40%. So two days of a whole customer services team is spent on, on inquiries which needn't have been made if somebody else had done what they said they were going to do. So clarity of expectation. It's also about time and effort. Again, one of the things about my Virgin Media experiences is the amount of time I spend on the phone, the amount of time I've got to contact them again and again, the amount of things that I've got to do to get the service that I want. And that time and effort is thinking about how easy is it for your customers to do business with you? How easy is it for them to get a repair done? How easy is it for them to raise a concern about antisocial behavior? How easy is it for them to actually engage with you? 
and it's reducing it and making it easy for customers. Purple resolution is a massive one. One of the key things about this one is, believe me, don't assume I'm telling a lie. Don't assume that I've done something wrong. And this resolution, this is one that's particularly relevant at the moment within the housing sector is, resolution, listen to me. Trust me and believe me. If you find that I'm not, I am lying, then obviously that's different. But trust me and believe me and give people the power to put it right first time. Not having to go to different levels to get it sorted. So resolution. And of course, all this leads to integrity. And integrity means, I'm going to use um, Aspire as an example because I know them off by heart. Their, their, their um, vision is building better futures by putting people first through being ambitious, through being um, courageous and through collaboration. And I've made a lie there, it's not courageous, it's creativity, through being creative, ambitious and collaborating. Now, what every one of their customers should experience is that, hang on, you do wanna make my life better because look at what you're doing. You are putting me first because look at what you're doing, but you are able to be creative or you are able to show me that all your teams are working together because that's how we actually earn integrity. I'm sure that all of you in this room, again, taking yourself away from being a housing professional is that you don't trust certain companies. You don't trust them because they don't do what they say they're gonna do. They've got a glossy website with all the values on, but when you're experienced with them, it doesn't work. And so it, it's thinking about those six pillars. And, and then finally, I wanted to leave you with um, before we, we have a final conclusion is six things that I think if you go away and do, you will help to start your journey towards customer centric culture. We've heard some great examples. Please use them from people who are on this, this call. But remember, don't focus on your processes. Focus on the customer journey, the customer journey, what they experience and what they value is important. And that's where that insight comes in which we've talked about quite a lot already, which is excellent. You need to ensure that you're collaborating on those customer journeys. So I use the, the easy example, which is a new let, is that the, everybody involved in that, each team is actually working together to think about, based on the insight that we're getting, what can we do to make this journey as good as it possibly can be? What processes do we need to change? What do we need to stop doing or what do we need to start doing? Make it easy for your customers. Gaining insight into their preferences means that you will respond to those preferences. And great insight with great people and a great culture which is empowering individuals to do the best and the right thing for their customers is so critical to this. The meaningful customer input we've, input we've spoken about a lot but measure the right things. I rip, pull my hair out at some of the numbers of KPIs that some housing organizations have, which you think, so what? What's important is that we're measuring outcomes, the outcomes for customers. For example, a sustainable let. For example, being empowered to actually make their lives better through employment opportunities, whatever the outcomes are, measure them. But also is, I hope that all of you will be talking with your teams and listening to each other, listening to your things that get in the way, things that help, things that can support you to actually make sure that you're removing the barriers. You've all got people who are really brilliant and you're probably gonna have some people who aren't so brilliant. Remove the barriers and make it easy for everybody. And if they don't do it then, then of course you need to have the conversations. Okay. Thank you, so, for, that, Simon. Thank you for bringing that in. It's, it's certainly, I think there's an awful lot of, an awful lot of takeaways there. Has anyone kind of got any last points we'd like to make in the last few minutes? I appreciate people have probably got their 12 o'clock Zoom teams, whatever coming up, because it's just meeting to meeting season. Has anyone got any points they'd like to make before we wrap up today? Absolutely wonderful. Well, look, Simon, thank you very much for joining today. Thank you for Pleasure. coming in. And, and, and can, I just make, can I just make an offer to people before we finish? Um, I've got a number of tools that I'm happy to let you have. 
to, to use. One of them is a customer centricity assessment tool, and it focuses upon understanding what your people think, understanding what leadership think, and most importantly, understanding what customers think. And it talks in terms of um, the things that they would say about their experience with your services. So drop me an email or message me on it, LinkedIn, and you can have them. I'll make sure I share everyone's free. things on a, on a LinkedIn thing anyway, but thank you to everyone uh, for joining today. I say my name's Matthew Baird. If you need a hand with the recruitment, that's great. But more importantly, please keep supporting these roundtables. Next week is going to be a really interesting one that ties in actually with something Dolores mentioned right at the beginning of the call to those who run it then, which is how do you build um, a, a proper EDI culture with your local, um, I'm doing it with a Bromsgrove District Housing, Housing Trust. How do you engage your local community to build a better EDI culture within your housing provider? So how do you reach out to those you know, we, we talked, you know, I know Lynn mentioned earlier about one of the things that is can't engage with customers. Well, if you could get a local church or, or, or faith group on site, if you could get a local community group on site, how do we bring those together to really support EDI in the community so that your housing association better represents your tenants? Uh, that'll be next week at 11. For now, though, thank you everyone for joining. I'll get the recording and things sent round and I look forward to seeing you all at a future event. And Simon, thank you again. Pleasure. Thank you very much, everybody. Cheers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.